Well, thank you, Terry, for that very understated welcome. <laughs> I've watched a lot of these ceremonies, you know, the Oscars and the Emmys, and uh, I've always mouthed at uh, everyone who goes up to get a prize, and they never know what to say, do they? And they, they're all in tears, and they're all gushing, and they're saying how surprised they are. I always assumed they'd know who'd won the prizes maybe a few days before. So I must thank somebody, and there's so many people here tonight that uh, I should. I've really done very not, uh, really little in my life. I've just waffled along, uh, loving the game of golf and being observant, and things have always just come my way. I listen to people and they say, I've always wanted to do that job or that job or that, and they've worked and schemed and connived to get it. Whereas all these wonderful things have uh, just fallen into my lap for some inexplicable reason. The two people I should really thank, first of all, are my mother and father. I want you to picture the scene and the time. It was late April, 1930. My father was the golf professional at the Vanze Golf Club on the outskirts of Berlin. He was, uh, he'd been in the First World War and he fought with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Wounded twice, came out though. He was uh, born in 1897. He came out as a 20, 21 year old and um, went into the world of golf. He'd done a bit of caddying and that sort of thing. Anyway, in 1926, he decided, I thought bravely or foolishly, when a job was advertised in Germany that he would go and work there because on the continent you became a professor. Whereas uh, in Britain you were just uh, Alice the Pro, come on, where's my shoes? Have you done the blah But on the continent, you were really something a bit special. He built up a very good reputation as a teacher at this club, which was very splendid. And I can picture the scene, the end of April, father had a busy day teaching, jogging across the course. They lived in a very handsome bungalow in the middle of the, just by the 11th fairway, in the middle of the Black Forest where Vansy Golf Club was situated. And I can see uh, Mother standing at the door with the light behind her, probably wearing her best Winsiette nightgown with the high collar and long sleeves. And Father arriving back home and uh, supper's ready, dear, and sitting down. What sort of day have you had? And he would say, well, it's been, it's been a bit tricky today. The word Nazi had not been invented then, but there were some nasty people. And he explained to my mother, what a miserable day he'd had, and the people were horrible. But as he drank his soup, he started to smile, and he said, but I sent two of them the way with the worst slices you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> he said, the sort of slice that is totally incurable <laughs> and will stay with them all their days. And somehow I felt that that was indeed a little bit of a come up and to get back for his two bullets that had gone through his arm those few years before. I was indeed the heaviest baby. 37 years I had that record. I was one of twins, would you believe, but the uh, other boy did not develop. Mother was five foot two and weighed about 120 pounds. And so she had a very difficult time. I mean, I was, you know, that sort of big. Uh, almost ready for work as soon as I popped up. <laughs> she did have a difficult time, and I know for a fact it was almost seven months before she rode her bicycle. <laughs> that was a joke for the gynecologist, actually. <laughs> 1932, the family came back to Britain. Father got, went on his professional career playing and teaching good golf jobs. And I went to school and all that stuff. And the, but the first competition I ever played was 1946, the boys' championship, played on the west side of Edinburgh, a course called Brunsfield. And I went there, and I, I was playing off scratch at that time, and I went there, and uh, they, they picked me to play for England boys against the Scots. And I played very well, and we beat the Scots. We, they'd been beating us every year. We won about eight, six, or something. And I was installed as one of the favorites to win. Sailed th through a few rounds, and then I was up against a little lad called Donald Dunstan in the semi-finals. Rather pasty, pale-looking boy with very bad complexion. 
And I was six foot tall and bordering on the beautiful, I suppose, at that time. <laughs> I really was. I mean, I look at those old pictures and I really fancied myself at the time. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we set off, and I won the first couple of holes, and I was striding. You know, it was a beautiful day. And anyway, he beat me three and two, <laughs> which brought me down to earth a bit. And uh, going back on the train, my father said, uh, well, you've learned your lesson. You should have done this. You should have uh, defended when you attacked, and da-da-da-da-da-da. He said, but uh, I don't think there's any point in you trying to, for any further education. You're not going to be a doctor, lawyer, accountant. You should be my. You could come and be my unpaid assistant at Ferndown. So I thought it was very generous, Dad. Uh, he was, remember, a Yorkshireman, and he'd been spending a lot of time with the Scots in the First World War. So, uh, so it came to pass. <laughs> I went to work for my dear old dad, and I had no concept at that time, going back a bit crestfallen, having been beaten by this pimply-faced youth when I had so much to offer. <laughs> I had no idea that uh, the game of golf would take me down so many wonderful paths. I played uh, pretty well. I got in my first Ryder Cup cap in 1953, went on to play in another seven World Cups 10 times, winner of 20 odd tournaments. And then the chance of television came along, a journalistic experience, writing for a couple of newspapers, magazines and so on and so on but of all the uh, the places and things I've had people say what which part of your life did you enjoy the most I've enjoyed it all because I've never really worked very hard at it as uh, dear old Gary player will uh, absolutely guarantee that he never saw me out practicing I used to I used to hit a dozen balls with a two iron I was bloody good with a two iron one of the most difficult clubs you and the ground was a bit rough, and, and if I hit sort of seven decent ones out of ten, I didn't see the point in spending there all day long hitting any more. <laughs> I knew how it worked, and if it went all right, it was fine. I must tell Tiger that one day if I get a chance to see him. <laughs> but it was a wonderful time for learning, and then, of course, in the... Uh, uh, I started doing television in the early 60s, and by 1974, Pro Celebrity Golf had started. And through my association with Mark McCormick and ING, he introduced me to the world of television over here, uh, working for ABC Television. And I can, uh, it's very difficult to pick uh, the BBC or ABC. I'm a, an Englishman, and of course, one is always happiest at home. But I never enjoyed myself more than coming here and working with ABC. Why? Well, they were lovely people. One or two of them shouted a bit and swore, um, but they didn't swear at me too often. And uh, the big boys always wound up the tournaments. They did the 17th and the 18th hole, so I could clear off after the 16th green. I suppose in four days of television, I might have actually spoken for about an hour. And they paid me a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> and a first class airfare from London. And if it was necessary, use the Concorde. So I had nothing to complain about at all. Uh, but I've loved coming here and working on the television and watching the changing face of the world of golf. The Alices have been around the game for over 100 years. And we've pretty well seen everything. Uh, you know, all the changes in equipment and clubs and what have you, and people say, well, what has been the most significant part of the game? And probably something silly like cylindrical mowers to cut the fairways, you know. In the early days, and I've always said the players between 1900 and 1930 were probably the most skillful the world has ever seen. And they look at you when I say that as if I'm potty, which I am on occasions. But I do believe if you look at the equipment they had, and you can go to the museum here and look at it, the balls weren't round, the equipment was very weird, the greens weren't cut, a few sheep would nibble away and that was that. <laughs> the bunkers weren't raked, they perhaps from 1926 on they raked them on Mondays and Fridays. 
and that was it. And players had to scoof over the holes they made in the bunkers. And yet they were going round in 72 and 74s on our championship courses, uh, which was quite remarkable with the tools they had, people like Bobby Jones and the people before him, quite remarkable. That doesn't mean to say that I don't marvel at the skills of the players today. But I do believe, and I'm not saying this as some old fart, um, <laughs> with the equipment today, it has changed the face, not only of golf, of sport. I, one of my dearest friends is Sterling Moss, motor racing driver. Now, when he was in his peak, they used proper petrol in the car, not the special methane, whatever it is today. And if you hit something, you crashed, car burst in flames, and you died. Now they have these wonderful cars which they can hit a wall at 200 miles an hour and the chances are you'll escape with a couple of broken ankles. Everything has improved. I saw Roger Bannister break the four minute mile and he, as he went through the tape he almost died. Now they do the four minute mile in about three and a half minutes and they come off and the, the fellow's waiting, well what do you think about that? Oh, I feel like I'll clear off. But they're hardly out of breath. These fellows are hardly, and women are hardly out of breath. So chi times have changed quite dramatically. I've loved every moment of it, and coming here, and this, I'm not saying this uh, just because you're all here and everyone's looked after, my wife and my son and his uh, dear wife, Kelly Rose, while we've been here. Uh, I'm not just saying it because of all that, because people are expected to say it. This facility is the most remarkable I've seen in the world of golf. It's sort of a golf's answer, answer to uh, Disney World to me because you go to Disney World and you marvel at what was created there. The museum, the golf courses, the hotel. When you come in from the main road, the way the gardens are prepared, the trees, the, the staff, the volunteers, it's quite magical. And I've seen a fair bit of stuff in my time but it is truly amazing the way they've done the museum, the way it's uh, encapsulated all these personal bits and pieces of memorabilia. It's quite st stunning. And uh, <laughs> quite stunning. <laughs> so uh, it's time to go. I could waffle on for another four or five hours, but um, <laughs> I just want to say this. Uh, uh, think of it often. Uh, because I did leave school early. I, I was quite bright, but uh, I remember my last report which was sent home. We had a, a, a headmistress at my modest school. It was called Crosby House School. She was a Mrs. Violet Weymouth. And she was a short Welsh woman about that big and about that wide, and she smoked. She always had a cigarette dangling out of her mouth. And the smoke used to trickle up here, and it was... You can see where the smoke went. It was sort of a brown line up there. <laughs> but she was... You, uh, you didn't mess about with Mrs. Weymouth, I can tell you that. And I'm always staggered today when I read that children go to school and beat up the, 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 you know, the teachers. I think wouldn't have done that in my day, I tell you that. But I remember the last report she sent back to my parents, and it went something like this. Peter does have a brain, but he's rather loath to use it. <laughs> His only interests appear to be the game of golf and Violet Pretty. <laughs> a girl allied to, she never knew about Iris Baker, but they were the two <laughs> that introduced me to some of the ways of the world. <laughs> Which, uh, which I'll be eternally grateful. <laughs> and although we were very young, I wish to God I could do it today. <laughs> I fear for his future were the last words she wrote on my report. So her mum and dad died a long, long time ago. And if there is such a thing as heaven, and if people do look down, um, well, mum, dad, here we are, look at this lot. <laughs> look where I've been, look what I've done. 
never worked very hard at it, and it's all fallen into place. Lovely family, lovely wife, looks after me, shouts a bit occasionally, but uh, <laughs> they are remarkable. They put up with all my nonsense, and uh, I love them dearly. And Mrs. Weymouth, if you're there, Thank you. Good night.